We have invested more than $3 billion in business across the country and have created approximately 11,000 jobs for local residents. Shorebank has thrived for nearly 35 years by specializing in specific local markets for the long term. Underwriting is done in a face-to-face -face meeting so that qualitative judgments can be made about character and capacity. The bank is not interested in financing speculation, but is interested in using its funds so that residents can acquire property and build their net worth. This is, after all, the way in which most Americans build wealth. Long ago, a very good friend and now deceased friend of ours, of Mary's and mine, Al Raby, who is a community organizer and um, co-chairman with Dr. King uh, in Chicago back in the late 60s, reminded us that poverty is really the absence of choice. When you lose a job or have medical bills but no financial cushion, your choices are very narrow. With enough money, enough capital, enough savings to ride out a storm, your choices increase. Now, ironically, the neighborhoods that have been restored during the past 30 years as mortgage credit became readily available to minorities were the very same neighborhoods that during the past three to four years became the targets of unscrupulous brokers who saw a rich opportunity to originate predatory mortgage loans. Advances in computer-based loan processing, securitization of mortgages, and internet-based communication systems all made new methods of mortgage origination possible. These changes occurred very quickly and were often exploited by unregulated mortgage and investment businesses. As we all know all too well, several million homeowners now face the prospect of losing their homes. The problems are nationwide, but speculative markets and minority neighborhoods have been the hardest hit. We do not know the end of this story as yet. At its worst, Mrs. Smith, who bought a home in 1988, but loses her job in 2008 and cannot keep up her mortgage, or the Jones family that finally bought its first home in 05 with a mortgage that it thought it could afford, only to see the monthly payments double, will end up losing everything. But we don't know how many Mrs. Smiths and Mrs. Jones will quietly be able to ride out the storm. There is much more resiliency in this community than many people realize. So looking at this recent history of predatory lending, what are some of the ethical principles that we, as a society, should learn from this rampant demonstration of fraudulent greed? I have counted at least seven lessons, and there are probably more. First, a lender has an obligation to both his or her organization and to the borrowers to make loans that the borrower has a reasonable ability to repay. This most fundamental principle of banking was ignored for several reasons. Lenders went into an originate and sell mode with few checks on what they were selling. Regulators did not adequately assess the risk of new, complicated financial instruments, and regulations did not provide adequate authority to monitor and control the excesses. Lenders bought loans from other parties that were operating only on a fee-for-service basis and had no interest in the sustainability of the loan. And borrowers, generally encouraged by those selling them the loans, lied about their capacity to repay. The second lesson is that many of the parties interacting directly with borrowers were compensated on a basis that gave them an interest that was inconsistent with the borrower's interest. And they acted in their own selfish interest and misled the borrower into believing that they were acting in the borrower's interest. This is the clearest with mortgage brokers, who are often paid higher fee income the higher the interest rates that they were able to squeeze out of the borrower. But real estate brokers also were primarily interested in getting the highest price available under the fastest possible sales conditions, even if the house was more than the borrower could afford and the loan was suboptimal. Three, 
It is pretty clear that brokers and lenders of many stripes took advantage of borrower inability to understand complex mortgage instruments, as well as borrower self-delusion. The fact that the Federal Reserve Board is now writing a rule that says you cannot advertise rates in one language and put the fine print only in English is just an example of the extreme lack of respect for the truth. This was undoubtedly worse in lower income, elderly, and minority communities, although it went throughout the spectrum. Four, security firms, unlike mortgage brokers, actually have a statutory suitability obligation, and issuers are supposed to disclose information for the protection of investors. The disclosures were impossible to understand, even when the information was technically included, and investments were clearly sold to borrowers, like small municipalities and pension funds, that may have technically been sophisticated but could not possibly have understood what they were buying. And even if they did understand it, it was not suitable. When the initial investor was capable of understanding, like a big mutual fund, shares were ultimately sold to those who didn't have a clue. The fact that many relied on ratings put out by entities paid by the issuer for these ratings did not help. Five. An entire generation of regulators believed that their obligation was to let the market flow most efficiently rather than to reach out and protect consumers. Six, I think it is fair to say that borrowers have an obligation to tell the truth about their ability to repay to lenders. In fact, it's actually a perjury violation not to for most home loan applications. There is very good evidence that truth-telling truth had taken an extended holiday. Seven, 